Sanjay, I request you to make your remarks, and then I'm sure there are lots of questions that are going to come from the audience. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so actually, I start from where Ulf exactly left, is that what does India need to do and what should be the Indian approach? My actually job has been made much easier. We had uh, such a fantastic session in the morning uh, outlining um, what is actually happening and how the whole thing is being put together. What I'll actually try to do in the next uh, few slides is really quickly walk you through uh, the industry's view in terms of what's happening and how things need to happen. This slide is really a summary slide. Arun Mehra, I think, really summarizes very well that while it's important to have the lowest cost of any product that we can buy in the ESDM sector, because of the size of the market, uh, it's not a choice that India has, so we have to build this industry. Number two is really the, the which leads to the trade deficit issue, and number two is the strategic and security issues, which, again, uh, for the unique geography that we live in, uh, is an important issue for the country. And number three, which again is that we will have a very large amount of workforce which will be ready to work, but it's important that we create work for them. And, and part of the ESDM industry is it's, it's, a, it's a very in a unique industry where it creates a lot of high-end jobs, but it also creates a lot of uh, jobs which can be used by people with uh, lesser education. In terms of the key ingredients, uh, we've talked about many of them. Uh, I've just tried to color code. I, I don't think the green one is very visible. Uh, we all know about the, the talent uh, and the domestic market. I think these are the two largest assets that we have. And any policy or any structure that India is doing really is leveraging the two together. So once, once I kind of give a view of how all the policies and everything fits together, these are really the two most important ingredients. Then you look at the other two things, which are what are sustainable competitive advantages that India has in the long term. In my mind, actually, there are two. Number one is that if you really see how the systems are growing, lot and lot of the differentiation in a system is coming from software. And if you see how the chips are growing, again, a lot of the differentiation is coming from the fabulous design aspect. The, the, the soft part of a system is actually becoming the largest component of the value chain, whereas the hard part of the system, whether it's the final silicon or the, or the, or the uh, system that comes together, contributes to a lesser part of the value chain. So I think given our natural advantage of people, innovation, R&D, and, and, and uh, the talent that we have, I think that's one advantage. The second advantage is the amount of, you know, someone talked about it, I think, yesterday, is the capital efficiency, I think Libu talked about it, is the capital efficiency that comes in India. To do the same amount of product, you could do it with one-fourth of the investment. I think that really is something when an SME or an entrepreneur starts in India, it will become a big long-term sustainable advantage. The green part is actually is a favorable government policy support which was missing and which I think, uh, and I can say with a lot of conviction today, uh, has come in place. The red part I put is the component in the EMS industry. I would say that that is the infrastructure related stuff. That relates to the picture that we've showed. Yes, there are a lot of problems in the country. There are a lot of things which need to get fixed. I think there's adequate infrastructure, but that's something that can be built up and that's something can be uh, uh, you know, uh, coming together in the years to come. Last part I talk about is funding. Funding is again actually a very interesting thing. I wasn't sure it's a red or a green, so I actually put it blue. Because there's a lot of money available, first of all. When you talk to the uh, government agencies, they say, oh yeah, we have this fund, that fund, and you know, but you know, as you all know, 10 to 20% of that is used. You talk to the private equity, VCs, everybody says, oh yeah, I'm waiting to invest in a product company, guys. I've been you know, <laughs> investing in too many services companies, but where are the product companies? So there is an appetite, but for some reason, because of the other elements which are not in place, uh, the funding aspect wasn't coming out uh, in the form, especially at the early stage uh, of, of the growth of the company. But I think it's, it's available and it just needs to happen. So the enabling ingredients are, are really there. And what have been the challenges so far? So the number one challenge I really feel was that, like in, and, and since auto is a very good example, like in auto industry, there was a gradual phasing in and phasing out of duty structures vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the, the capabilities of the domestic industry. Just imagine, in the year 2000 or before, if we had zero duties imports on any automobile that we, that we could import from abroad, I, I would have serious objections or doubts where we could have created the kind of industry that we have, whereas today India is the global hub of small cars, just because of how the structure happened. Correspondingly, ITA1, which is the uh, uh, WTO uh, uh, element which caused zero duties on most electronic products, I think it really gave no motivation and then the services and consumption led stuff took over. So I think that was one uh, stuff. 
And that has resulted in that even whichever in the small scale, if you see there are a lot of products in India, they never got to the economies of scale because they could never compete on day one uh, with companies who have global economies of scale. And then there's, of course, the you know, well-drafted 22% uh, uh, disability factor, which is a combination of infrastructure, finance, uh, as well as a lack of any explicit in incentive. So these were the challenges which I think were faced, but I think the recent government policies systematically address both the aspects of those. Now, what is that Indian approach that makes sense? So really there are two approaches at a high level which could be taken. The manufacturing driven approach, which I call as moving up the value chain approach, you know, which is what China took, for example. You start with very low end manufacturing, then you say, okay, let's start doing components, let's do transfer of technology, and then, you know, over a period of time, we'll do, you know, system design or chip design. So in my mind, it's a bottoms up, you know, increase the value chain approach. The other approach could be a top-down approach, you know, which is let's start off with system design, fabulous chip design, which is where we are good at, which is where we probably need much lesser investments compared to the bottoms-up approach where you need land, you need infrastructure, you need capabilities, you need time, which is what I think is another important element. So we start top-down, and then for whatever you need to do in, the, you know, in, in that arena, you build the appropriate infrastructure for EMS and, of course, the components in the form of silicon and so on. I'm not saying don't plant those seeds right now, but fundamentally, we need to decide which is an approach which is going to take us forward in the time period, because we cannot, again, wait for a long time and long gestation period for all these things to happen.